Hello, and welcome to Endocrine and Reproductive System. This is the female reproductive physiology, and this is Lynn. All right, let's get started. In this session, we're gonna cover the following learning objectives. We'll describe oogenesis and its relationship to changes in the ovarian follicle. Explain the roles of FSH, LH, estradiol, and inhibin in oogenesis and follicular maturation. Describe ovulation and the formation and decline of the corpus luteum and the roles of the hormones in each of these processes. We'll describe the hormonal regulation of estrogen and progesterone biosynthesis and secretion by the ovary. Identify cells responsible for their biosynthesis, the mechanism of their transport in blood, and how they are degraded and removed from the body. We'll list the major target organs and cell types for estrogen action and describe its effects on each. Describe the action and cellular mechanisms of estrogen. List the principal physiological actions of progesterone, its major target organs, cell types, and describe its effects on each. Describe the action and cellular mechanisms of progesterone and other progestins. Illustrate the timing of changes in the blood levels of FSH, LH, estradiol, progesterone, inhibin, and correlate these with structural changes in the endometrium and the ovary seen during the menstrual cycle. We'll describe how the changes in the ovarian steroids produce the proliferative and secretory phases of the uterine endometrium and menstruation and the changes in basal body temperature during the menstrual cycle. We'll explain the interplay of the hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian, and uterine cycles. All right, let's get started. Female reproductive system. The female reproductive system includes the ovaries and accessory organs, which include the uterine tubes, the uterus, the vagina, the clitoris, and the mammary glands. The missagittal section through which the pelvis is shown is this internal reproductive structures, and you can see the urinary bladder and the rectum. The peritoneum folds over selective pelvic organs and lines two major pouches. We have the interior region called the vesicuterin pouch, which forms a space between the urinary bladder and the uterus, the posterior rectouterine pouch that forms a space between the rectum and the uterus. The ovaries are paired oval organs located in the female pelvis, and they're anchored in the pelvis by these specific ligaments the broad ligaments, the ovarian ligaments, and the suspensory ligaments. There is this double-fold peritoneum called the mesovarium. This attaches to each ovary at the hilum, which is the anterior surface of the ovary, where majority of the blood vessels enter and leave. Each ovary is then supplied by both an ovarian artery and an ovarian vein. The nerve supply to the ovary comes from the sympathetic axons of T10, and the parasympathetic axons come from the vagal nerve. The outer layer is called the cortex, and the inner region called medulla contains the branching of the blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. Oogenesis and follicular development in the ovaries. Oogenesis is the maturation of primary oocyte into a secondary oocyte. Oogenesis begins really early prior to birth. It continues all the way through menopause, which is time that a female no longer has menstrual period. Prior to birth, the ovary contains what we call the primordial or germ cell lines called the oogonia. These are the early stages of the egg cell. And these cells are diploid, and during the fetal life, they undergo changes and they go to mitosis, and they form the primary oocytes. They go through the different phases of the cell division, but they pause in prophase. And during the month, there are this monthly cycle called the ovarian cycle, and it's divided into three phases, the follicular phase, ovulation, and lutea phase. These are heavily regulated by various hormones, which we'll talk about. The follicular genesis is divided into two large snapshots. The preantral, which is the development of the primordial follicle, and the antral stage, which is about 65 days, where you mature into the graphenia follicle and is regulated by the two hormones, FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. Oogenesis and follicular development in the ovaries. There are numerous ovarian follicles in the ovaries. An ovarian follicle consists of an oocyte that is surrounded by the follicular cells. The premature early stages is called the oogonia or the primordial ova. Each of these primordial ova collects around it a layer of cells called the granulosa cells. These ones have significant role in regulating and secreting the female sex hormone. During the first mitotic division, each oocyte will then divide into two large ovums, which is called the secondary oocyte, and a cell that decays called the polar body. 300,000 oocytes remain in the ovaries after embryonic development, and only a small percentage between 400 to 500 of these ever mature. The mature follicles are also known as the graphenian follicle. 
they form the antral follicle, which contains that secondary oocyte that is going to pause at the later phases of cell division. See the stages of the development going from the primordial serum cell line down to the oogonium, oogonium to the primary oocyte, primary oocyte going to the secondary oocyte, which is arrested in metaphase two. And then when the fertilization occurs, when the sperm comes in, it finishes and completes meiosis two. And there you have a zygote, which is a fertilized egg cell. On the right, you can see the changes to the remainder of the follicle in the ovary. This is a small primordial follicle and small in size. Primary follicles increase in number of cells. There's a lot more granulosa cells. As it matures, the ovum is then released out by way of several signaling of hormones and then it leaves into a regressed form of a scar tissue called the corpus luteum, which maintains that during pregnancy. The female hormone system, like the male hormone system, consists of three tiers of hormones. The first one is called the hypothalamic releasing hormone, called gonadotropin releasing hormone, abbreviated as GNRH. The anterior pituitary sex hormone is called the follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. Both of these are secreted in response to GNRH from the hypothalamus. The ovarian hormones that are secreted are going to be your estrogen and progesterone, which are secreted by the ovaries when there is a response to the two other hormones from the pituitary gland. The GnRH is released from the hypothalamus and increases and decreases a little bit less drastically than FSH and LH, but it is secreted in bursts or pulses every 90 minutes. You can see the approximate change in concentration of the anterior pituitary gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH. And then compare that with the ovarian hormones, the estradiol, estrogen, and progesterone. Over a month of period of time of 28 days, the estrogen increases substantially in the beginning few weeks of the cycle. And then it is overtaken by progesterone as that matures and prepares the uterus for the implantation. At the bottom, you can see the spiking of the LH surge. LH will peak up midway in the cycle to cause the ovulation to occur. And FSH also hitchhikes really high as well. So there is fluctuations and undulations of these hormones. Gonadotropic hormones and their effects on the ovaries. The ovarian changes that occur during sexual cycle depend very heavily on the gonadotropic hormones FSH and LH, which are secreted by the anterior pituitary. Both of these hormones are very small glycoproteins. They have a weight of about 30,000 daltons. When there is an absence of these hormones, the ovaries remain basically inactive. So at the ages of nine to 12, the pituitary begins to secrete more FSH and LH, which will eventually lead to the start of the female cycles. That usually happens between, again, ages about 11 to 15, and this changes is called puberty. The first menstrual cycle is called menarche. The development of the breast tissue is called thearche, and the development of the pubic and axillary hair is called pubarche. Both of these hormones are going to target the ovarian cells. Almost all of these FSH and LH receptors are stimulatory in effect and they activate the cyclic adenosine monophosphate second messenger system in the cell cytoplasm. This will then cause a formation and activation of protein kinases and then lead to phosphorylation of several enzymes that stimulate the sex hormones. Ovarian follicle growth, the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle. When a female child is born, the ovum is surrounded by a single layer of granulosa cells that protects the ovum. With this granulosa cell sheath, we call it the primordial follicle. And you can see as it changes through the monthly cycle, it gets larger and larger. The primary follicle is going to be surrounded by more layers of granulosa cells and eventually creates this fluid filled region called the antrum and leads into the bursting of the egg cell out and then changes into the corpus luteum, a regressed form, and then degenerating into the corpus albicans. Throughout the childhood, these granulosa cells are thought to give some sort of a protection and nourishment for the ovum. It also secretes an oocyte maturation inhibiting factor that keeps the ovum suspended in that primordial state. Where puberty happens when FSH and LH is able to release in significant quantities, the ovaries begin to grow and also some of these follicles. The ovarian follicular growth. During the first few days of each month, the female cycle increases if it's just slightly greater than that of LH. These hormones, especially FSH, begin to cause acceleration growth of about six to 12 follicles every month. This initial effect will then lead to proliferation of that granulosal cell layer. This gives rise to more layers of cells and gets it thicker. 
It eventually gives rise to a second layer of massive cells called the theca. The theca is then divided into two layers, the internal layer and the external layer. The internal layer is composed of epithelioid tissue, similar to that of the granulose cells, but they have the ability to secrete additional sex hormones, estrogen progesterone. So the theca interna has many LH receptors. They utilize a CAMP system to increase cholesterol conversion to androstenediones, which will then supply the creation of estrogen progesterone. And then the theca interna develops into the highly vascular layer of the capsule for the follicle. After these early phases of proliferative growth, uh, that mass of cells begins to secrete that follicular fluid that has a high amount of estrogen. And then the early growth of the primary follicle up to the antral phase is mostly stimulated by the FSH alone. The estrogen will then cause the granulosa cells to increase more numbers of FSH receptors, which is a positive feedback. And this increasing amount of estrogen from the follicle combined with that boost in LH is going to cause more cell proliferation and growth. Probably after a week or more of growth, one follicle begins to outgrow the others while the other ones stay stagnant. The remaining ones that stop growing go to atresia. Estrogen from the most rapidly growing follicle acts on the hypothalamus and it begins to slow down that increasing amount of SSH because only one single follicle gets to mature. The function and the process of atresia is not fully understood, but it is believed that when there's a high amount of estrogen from that one follicle, it somehow serves as a negative feedback to decrease and depress the amount of FSH secreted by the anterior pituitary gland. This process is very important because this allows ideally one child to develop during each pregnancy. So this will then lead to ovulation. So on the normal 28 day cycle, about halfway in the month, 14 days after the onset of the menstruation, the follicle begins to swell rapidly and the central region of the follicle is referred to as a stigma. 30 minutes later, it's going to start pushing and oozing out from the follicle. And then within two minutes, that stigma will then rupture, causing the ovum to exit out of that cell layer.